Well, friends, good morning and welcome to 1030 Worship at First Presbyterian Church of Waco. If you didn't know, and maybe you didn't know, is that this is the new year. It is officially the new year, and I hope y'all all stayed up last night until midnight partying, um, because the first Sunday of Advent is actually the first Sunday on the church's liturgical calendar. So every year, the first thing that we do as a people is we celebrate the coming of Christ into the world year after year after year. And so if you were wondering, why are Parker and Chris wearing strange hats? Happy New Year. <laughs> well, everybody, we have a few announcements this morning that I want to bring to your attention. Um, also, we have a new announcements page. Page six of your bulletin has all the new happenings that are going on in the church life right now. Uh, two things to note is jazz and caroling on December 5th. If you like jazz and you like singing, you better be here. That's right. As well, um, I want to thank all the volunteers for coming out yesterday to help ring in the new year with all this lovely decoration. Yeah. as well. The space has been transformed, y'all. One other thing to note that Patty actually brought to my attention before the service is that we have, as is the Advent tradition, put up the family abuse Christmas tree. And so there are goods and gifts for y'all to purchase um, for some really needy folks this time of year. Um, but the date in terms of when you are to return them by is wrong. It says December 8th, but I don't believe that's true. So look out on Realm for that. We'll make sure to get you the real date um, later on. But please do stop by the tree and see what you might pick up this year. Oh, yes. Another thing to remember, the blood drive is coming up on December 4th. There's a QR code in the bulletin. Um, so we would love, if you have the opportunity or the need or the want, please come out and donate with us. Yes. And friends, it is the first Sunday of Advent, and so we are going to light the Advent tree. And so Sue and Pete Patrick have generously volunteered to light it for us. Watch and wait for Christ's coming. Light the candles of hope, peace, joy, and love, remembering the promises of God with prayer. We light this candle in hope. Let us pray. Faithful God, out of war's chaos, you bring the order of peace. Renew us in hope that we may work toward Christ's advent of peace among all nations. God of promise, God of hope, into our darkness come. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
Friends, would you rise with me in body or in spirit as we call ourselves to worship? Raise your heads. Come out of darkness, for our Redeemer draws near. Come, Emmanuel. Let love live beside us. The Lord incarnate, a king born on the margins, abundance brought to the lowly. Come, Prince of Peace, let mercy live within us. Like a parent runs out to meet their child, God dashes out to meet us again this Advent season. Come, Lamb of God, let praise flow through us. Let us worship God together. may be seated. Thank you. Friends, Advent is a time of patience. It's a time of waiting, a time of expectation. And so every week in Advent, we come before God, noting those places in our lives where maybe we've fallen short, where maybe we haven't, things haven't gone the ways that we hoped or wanted them to. And yet week after week, we come relying again on God's mercy. So friends, let us confess our sins together.
Would you pray with me? O oh Lord, our provision, we are drawn to the good things of life. We crave what makes life bounteous and rich, love, relationship, material stability and peace. Yet sometimes the goods of this life can become our ultimate aim and we can seek after them at the expense of our neighbor. Sometimes we look for complete satisfaction in the things that others cannot give. Our expectations can constrict ourselves and others. Forgive the yearning that leaves us restless and bewildered. Forgive us when we cannot go without so that our neighbors around the world might live better lives. Teach us to be your Advent people, O oh arriving one. Teach us to wait in our hunger and trust in your coming. Lord of mercy, forgive us, we pray. Friends, the good news of the gospel, the good news of Advent is that Christ comes to us year after year, week after week, day after day. And so truly this day, hear these words, you are forgiven. Amen. Amen. After a week of bountiful abundance, let us with our bellies full greet one another with thankfulness and grace, sharing the peace of Christ with one another, saying, the peace of Christ be with you. Let us invite our children forward at this time. We have one of the newest additions to this congregation, Reed Oliveras, and somehow he filled the spirit box this morning. He's full of spirit, I'm sure. We did try and pick things we liked. Well, there you go. <clears throat> All right, let's see what has arrived today. Okay, first we have this. Oh, you know what so what, is? what is this? I am a... This is a quiz, Parker. Oh, Do you this, know what is it this? is? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, neither of us do. It's a white noise machine. A white noise machine, okay. Do you all know what its function is? Does it play... Well, other than playing white noise. Playing white noise. Yeah. <laughs> it's a comforting thing for him because it sounds like when he was in utero and it, it mimics like blood flow and my heartbeat. Oh. Yeah, it makes him calm That's right amazing. now. That's amazing. Isn't that wild? That's a sermon in and of itself. <laughs> wow. That is astounding. Well, and we, that's, comfort is our theme. Oh, Ooh, there's a theme. Okay, Leave it okay. to the Oliveras family to have oh, a theme. We were, gonna, we were going to guess the theme. theme. No, sorry. That's, that's the challenge. Well, we picked the theme. And All right, what else? I'm sure you all know what that is. This. Oh. I'm sure you know what it is. This. Ah, yes. I have seen one of the 
for? <laughs> what is it, Parker? Uh, I think it's called a pacifier. Yeah. We're one for two, friends. We're one Hopefully for it's two. not used. It's not used. Yeah, it's, it's not used. used. Okay, it's brand clean. new. <laughs> brand new pacifier. Pulling it out. Okay. So what is... Okay. Go ahead. So I, let's just say somebody doesn't know what a pacifier is. Explain what it does. A baby sucks on the pacifier, and that also calms him down. Ah. So another yeah. method. So you, have, so you have the soothing noise, and then you have the actual act mm -hmm. of comfort that comes with placing something in your mouth. Yeah. Ah. Okay, friends, we're going we're gonna to edit this for rated G. <laughs> Everybody in the Zoom yes. room, we're editing it later. Okay. <laughs> so, what is, so what is this last piece? Uh, this, is a, this is my favorite one. Do you know who that is? That's you know, George Orwell. It's not. I, would, I was going to say Al Pacino, but I Also was, wrong. Okay, well, it's we Winston Churchill. Oh. oh my gosh, that's what I meant. Another British guy. <laughs> Sorry. It's Winston Churchill. So we have a poster of Winston. We, call him, we just call him Winston because we're BFFs. But we have a poster of Winston in our house from our, we had a big family trip the summer in 2019 before all the craziness happened. And Reed was just a star in the sky at that point. Yeah. Uh, but he loves to look at Winston. Oh, are you going to be the next prime minister of the United Kingdom, little guy? <laughs> he said maybe president of the United maybe. States. Okay, maybe. okay. That might be easier. Yeah. <laughs> well, Parker, what do you think about these gifts that we've been showed today? So what I, what I love about these gifts is that there's a... And even though they already told us the theme... There's something magical that kind of comes with each of these pieces. So I think the most surprising one is Winston Churchill. <laughs> now, whether just looking at him right now is very comforting or seeing it through Reed's eyes and him ad kind of admitting that this old man that he gets to see in this picture brings him peace. Now, I feel like there's a lot of things that kind of come up when we talk about comfort, whether it's the noise or an action that we do. There's a lot of things that we do ourselves that bring us comfort, but also that God does to bring us comfort. And God's in our presence, and that can be in so many different ways. <laughs> So friends, I want y'all to join us as we um, do our prayer for Let's children's time. God be in be my in head, my... God be in my heart, God be on my left, God be on my right. God, God be, be beneath, beneath me, God, God be, be above, above me, God, God in the faces of all who love me. Even Winston Churchill. Even Winston Churchill. Even Winston Churchill. <laughs> well, thank you Reed, you are a precious child of God, my friend. You are a joy. Thanks to Alvarez family. Friends, before our Hebrew scripture reading, will you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> God of different faces, we see you at times, but allow this time period, allow these moments of shalom, of peace, of silence to reverberate through our bodies as we listen for your word. Amen. So the Hebrew scripture reading today comes from Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27. Listen now for the word of the Lord. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus, you shall bless the Israelites. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they 
shall put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Friends, would you please rise for the reading of our gospel? Today's gospel lesson comes to us from St. Luke, the 21st chapter, verses 25 and following. And in those days, days there will be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, and on the earth, distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding at what is coming upon the world, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. 
Then they will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud with great power and glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. And as soon as they... And then he told them a parable. Look at the fig and all of its trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. And so also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all of these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life. And that day, so that day will not catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the entire earth. And so be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all of these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Friends, this is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. seated. Thank you. Friends, just a word before the sermon is that you may have seen me turn off the screen up here, and that may to you have seemed like an assault, like I just closed the door on our Zoom folk. That is not the case. The Zoom room is still very much open, and we are glad for all those who have joined us digitally today. We are just having some problems relaying that signal to this screen, so don't think we just shut the door on them. So just imagine with me a scenario. A couple has not seen their two adult children in two years because of the bodily vulnerability that comes with age. The children realizing that they cannot spend yet another holiday season without the family decides to fly coast to coast to visit those parents of theirs post-vaccine. And maybe you've seen these video clips on social media where those two adult children approach the doors of their parents' home and their parents open the door and what happens? Well, first there, you have no idea what's going on and they don't realize that it's their children standing before them. And then, wham, it hits them. Who is standing in the doorway? Their faces liven. A smile fills them from edge to edge, and their faces radiate joy, and they cannot contain themselves. Well, as strange as it might sound to you, I've been thinking a lot about the human face this Thanksgiving. I've been thinking about Zoom faces that have kept us connected over great distances and over what seems now like a great span of time. I've been thinking about those travel-weary college students who have just come home, maybe on a plane, and who greet their parents who have seen them for the first time in months. Or maybe on Facebook, I've watched as some of these adult children have gone and surprised their own parents after not seeing them for months and maybe now even years. Friends, all of these stories have something in common, at least one thing, and it is this. The beauty and radiance of the face when we seize people that we love. You know that way that your face literally contorts, the ways that your eyes get big and the skin stretches across your cheeks. Church, the grammar of our joy is literally written on our faces. 
It's one of the most beautiful parts of Scripture, I think, and it's in our numbers reading for today, is that the priestly blessing given to the Israelite people says that even the Lord's face shines upon his people. Isn't that a beautiful image? Church, the, like when God, when God looks at the faces of God's people, his face glows like Lauren and John Oliveira's when they look into the face of their baby Reed. When God waits on God's people, God is like that parent standing at the baggage claim in the airport, waiting to behold that child that they have not seen in far, far too long. That God's face shines on the people whom God loves. I think it's no mere coincidence that the Hebrew word for face is always accompanied with blessing, with compassion, and with mercy. That to make God's favor known to God's people is like God literally looking at us. God's presence among us, God's attention. And so the writer of Numbers personifies this blessing by ascribing it to God's face, a smile of approval, of love, and of worth. And also in Scripture, of course, the opposite of, is true as well. Maybe you've read in some of the Psalms over the years when the psalmist cries out to God, God, hide not your face from me in the day of trouble. That to just not see the face of God is to labor in affliction and suffering. But in the book of Numbers, the face that greets the travelers at the beginning of the, is the beginning of the story and not the end. I don't think we read often from the book of Numbers, and that's probably because it has a little bit of an understated name. It's kind of a boring name, if we're being honest, unless we're Amy Goodman and Numbers are our bread and butter. But you see, God's, the book of Numbers is about God's promise to a people. Maybe you know the story. Maybe you've heard it. That in the ancient days, God rescued the Hebrew people from slavery, from captivity in Egypt, and rescued them into God's care. And so the book of Numbers picks up right as the Hebrew people have been rescued from Egypt and are now gathered around Mount Sinai, waiting to see what God will do next. The Israelites have experienced the treacherous darkness of the human heart. They have been crushed under the foot of Pharaoh for far too long. And when we think of exploitation, we too often think, I think, of material degradation, of inequality, and that is certainly part of it. But in Scripture, one of the facets of exploitation and oppression is that it literally dehumanizes people. It is a cancer of the spirit, that oppression, what happens is that we dehumanize individuals. We hide their faces from us to cloak their humanity from us. And so naturally, what is the first thing that God does after he rescues these woebegone people from oppression in Egypt to this dehumanized, depersonified people? He says to them, my face shines upon you. He gives them their humanity back. You see, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is not just an abstract deity, but rather a Lord who lives in relationship. That God is a Lord who recognizes, who cherishes the humanity of all of his people in its depth and in its complexity, so much so that the ultimate blessing that a priest can give these people is to remind them of that relationship, to say that God's face shines upon them. Well, okay, pastor, I can already hear you saying, but how do we know if God's face actually shines on us? That's a great question. Are these words just mere poetry, personification? Or is there something else to them? Is there some deeper reality to them? You see, and I think the answer is this, is that we come to know that God's face shines upon us 
from the people who gather around us, from God's people who live with us. In the book of Numbers, the first thing that God does with the Israelite people is this, is he builds them into a community. He builds a caravan that will travel all together into the promised land. And he says this, he says, well, if you belong to this family, then you're going to stand here. And if you belong to this family, you're going to stand here. We're going to put the priests here and my tabernacle will rest in the middle of all of you. And they will all travel together. God in the book of Numbers is creating a family of faith a beloved caravan that will accompany the people from Egypt, from oppression, and into the promised land filled with abundance. But the point is this, friends. How do we know that God's face shines upon us? It's by living, it's by dwelling in the family of God's people by being that shining face for someone in need, or by being that beaming face and rejoicing in the joy of people who we love so dearly. Graham Greene is perhaps one of my favorite authors. Maybe some of you know him. And I think he distills something of this in his book, The Power and the Glory. Now, the book is set in, 19, in the 1930s in Tabasco in Mexico, a time when the government was busily suppressing the Catholic Church. And the novel focuses around a character entitled, or called, the Whiskey Priest. The Whiskey Priest. And even maybe by the name, you can already tell that this was a man of complex moral stature. A man who emulates little of the virtue expected by a priest. And yet in one of the most powerful scenes of that novel, the priest finds himself imprisoned. Imprisoned with him are various crooks and folks who have become criminals in Mexico, including people imprisoned simply for practicing their Catholic faith. One of the particularly religious people in this scene begins to chastise some of the behavior from some of their fellow inmates. She begins to bemoan the moral, repugnant, and corrupt souls that fill the cell along with her. She doesn't just see the people as lesser, but she literally sees them as ugly, as villainous. And then that whiskey priest says something remarkable. To the saint, he says, the scorned and the suffering even contain something of beauty because God lives with them. Let me quote some of this. He says, when you visualize a man or a woman carefully, you could always begin to feel pity because that was the quality that God's image carried with it. That when you saw the lines and the corners of the eyes, when you saw the shape of the mouth, how the hair grew, that it was absolutely impossible to hate. Because hate was just a failure of imagination. You see, hatred, friends, requires that we dehumanize another person. But to behold someone face to face makes hatred impossible. And the thing is this, it's that we don't get to choose whose faces God shines upon. Only God does. That we are not the ones in charge of adjudicating who is or who is not worthy of God's mercy. Only God can do that. This is the first day of the year, at least for the church. And every year, the church decides again and again th to throw a party for the coming of the Messiah. Beloved, Christ this year is coming towards us to become one of us again. And year after year, we remember not just that God was born as one of us, but we remember that God was born in rags. That God took the face of a marginalized Jewish man living in a country that we now call Palestine. 
The divine lived, dwelled on the margins so that we might know that even the marginal, even the unkept, even the dirty, that even that can become for us a conduit of God's presence. I think one of the hardest parts of being a Christian today is that there are so many social boundaries that we like to erect for ourselves. There are so many limits that we are taught to who is worthy and who is not worthy. Social psychologists and moral philosophers will tell us that there is a strong connection between seeing something and someone as morally objectionable and seeing them as spiritually polluted. In other words, people who we see as being bad people, who behave badly, we see them as disgusting. We see them as villainous. Maybe you can think of some of the ways that this has reared its ugly head in the past few years. And conversely, people who we think as being unkept or dirty become people who we think of being bad. When I was younger, my mother and I used to always go into Manhattan during Christmas time. There really is no place quite like New York City during Christmas time. It is absolutely magical. But I'll remember one time, one memory in particular, as I was walking down one of those bustling streets as the snow was covering the pavement, I remembered that in front of me there was a young girl and her mother. This young girl was dressed in a beautiful white coat and it looked like her and her mother were going off somewhere quite fancy. And I remember as she glanced over out of the corner of her eye and she saw a man sitting on the side of a building. He was with his dog. The man visibly looked unkept. He looked quite dirty. He looked like he probably hadn't had a shower in a long time. And I remember watching that young girl as she almost pulled her mother over as she made her mother stop. And for just a few moments, they lingered. And that young girl reached a hand into that beautiful white jacket, and out of it came a wad of dollar bills. I'm not sure how much. And she walked over to that man on the side of the road, and she reached her hand down, and his face lift up, lifted up. And she gazed at him and said, Sir, Merry Christmas. God bless you. Friends, we don't get to choose whose face God shines upon, but it shone on that man in that moment. This Advent season, we will remember a God who came in flesh for us, a God who literally became in face for us and for our salvation. And we commemorate this year after year. But I wonder this Advent season, as we wait for Christ to be born again into our midst, how might we be that face shining upon a world that needs it? How might the church be a glimmer of hope, not just for ourselves in this building, but for all people who need it, for all those who God's face shines upon? Friends, for the sake of the gospel and the sake of the world, amen. Please rise for the singing of our hymn.
Friends, in a season of mystery, in a season of discovery, we come with our questions, our concerns, but we also come together as a community. And so as one community, join with one another in the affirmation of faith. You, child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for we will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him to give the people knowledge of their salvation through the forgiveness of their sin. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn will break upon us. God will give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and the Lord will guide our feet in the way of peace. You may be seated. <clears throat> Friends, all good things come from God. And in moments like this, let us give back joyfully. I invite the ushers forward. Thank you. You may be seated. At this time, Dave Gray is going to offer us in a prayer of, of prayers for the people. Thank you. Let us pray. Father God, good morning. Thank you for this glorious day and this glorious week we just celebrated that we have filled with thanksgiving for all the bounties, both physical and spiritual, that we could possibly come up with. Help us remember all those things that have gone before and be thankful for them. Even though we miss those that have gone and we may somehow believe from time to time that the streets of heaven are too full. Help us remember that that's not true, that what's true is you needed them more than we needed them here. And we rejoice in that. Help us too to remember that the first Thanksgiving was the natives sitting down with the immigrants and rejoicing in what was available from this great land and what is still available today. 
both spiritually and physically. <clears throat> Help us be kind to our own language and avoid pronouncing the, phys the phrases everyone else pronounces. Have us think up our own because those words will come more directly from our hearts. <clears throat> Help us make an effort to separate ourselves from the internet, to look at the ink on the paper and feel more closely those words as they are meaningful to us. Help us to remember that gracious behavior is always more important than right belief. Join with me now as we recite corporately the prayer we have been taught by you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, would y'all please rise for your, your charge and benediction. Go out into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Render no one evil for evil, but instead help the weak. Safeguard the afflicted. Comfort those who mourn. Show love to every single person who needs it. Love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing always in the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, Advent is all about looking for the faces, about having your face shine on another so they will know that God's face shines on them. Go in peace. Amen.